Welcome to I'm Fine, Save Me, the show that encourages open, honest discussions centered around self-help by diving into mental health, suicide prevention, and the power of being open and putting it all out on the line. Each week, Burl has in-depth discussions with interesting people he finds online and sees how far the rabbit hole goes. Join us now with our host, Burl Stricker. What's up, man? Can you hear me okay? You too busy for this? No, no, you're good. It's just it's just how it is around here. <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. Yep. It is Christmas Eve. Is that a good or a bad thing? No, that's great. Um, I'm a little humbug. Little hum- get up right. Little humbug. That's not good. Yep. A little bit. So, and what's your plans today? I think we really actually don't have anything planned, but I think we are going to go meet up with mom. She is wanting to go to Sulphur. Oh, she's wanting to go to Sulphur because there's a winery there that she wants to get some stuff run. And I don't know if you know, but Sulphur, they've got a pretty nice little park. It's got some trails and stuff, and they've got like a natural spring and a creek. I'm going to go look at it and see what it looks like all frozen. So I think we're going to do that today. That'll be pretty cool. I think I told you this before. I used to work in sulfur. Okay. I lived in Ardmore, but worked in sulfur. I got you. So I actually did a lot of sightseeing around that area. It's a beautiful area. It really is. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be Um, cool I think it'd be cool to see that that natural spring to see what it looks like while it's freezing, as cold as it's been. So, you need to drink the water. Yeah, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. I think we talked about it, but they say that like every every morning, farmers, ranchers come by there and uh, drink it. Yeah, supposed to like keep mosquitoes and. Well, they used to have, um, you know, and I've heard that all my life. You know about people drinking the water there. You know, they've yeah. got they've got the little uh gosh, I don't even know what to call it, but it's almost like a like a little stone hut type thing where the spring would actually they had it plumbed to the spot and they said it that people would come drink it as like a medicinal purpose back yeah. in the day. That's pretty cool. Let's see if it makes a difference. I'm gonna turn on this one thing that I don't normally have that's not on it's not my stuff. So I'm trying to get used to it. So, man, why do you think I, we? this came up on the kind of the last podcast? Why do you think like we talked about stuff yesterday, but why do you think only about 20 percent of the world or let's say United States, 20 percent of the United States actually attend church? That's just a huge waste of time. This is, and, you know, <laughs> and from my background, you know, that comes from someone who used to be an ordained minister. It's it's. I can't hardly stand to sit in church anymore. It's um, I've been behind the scenes too much. You know, I don't know. It's there's a point where I think a lot of the world has recognized that. Well, I guess think about it this way. How much money do you think it takes to operate a church, especially whenever you have a massive building, you've got staff, how much good is the church actually doing from the world whenever all the money that comes in from tithing gets right. put right back into this building that y'all spend one hour, maybe two hours a week in. And I think a lot of the world has recognized that it's not practical. It's not, um, it's not very accepting. A lot of it's very surface level. You know, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Don't dare say that. Like, actually, I'm having a really bad time. Like, OK, well, let's stop everything we're doing. Let's set aside. Let's actually talk about it until you feel better. It's, you know, put the mask on. That's a, you know, it's kind of a little bit of rambling there. But I think that <laughs> like, I agree with you. I, I, it's like it's not it doesn't seem real. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I think it's easy to put too much emphasis on that one hour, kind of like what you're mm-hmm. saying. It's like, man. You know, one hour, it's like if you're talking about your spiritual life and if that's as important as your mental health or your physical health or any of that, it's like, man, I'm dedicating one hour. And I think we put too much emphasis on the church. It's like there has to be spirituality like way outside that. So all the other times, all the other, you know, interactions there has to be or 
you you know, they talk about being spiritually bankrupt. I mean, I felt that way, like I was spiritually bankrupt at times, you know, it's just, oh, yeah. you know, and then I think I put too much emphasis on the church and, and you know, saying, you know, that, oh, they're going to be the answer. Or that's the answer, you know, yeah. and then realized that and then disappointed, you know, and, and part of it's, you know. I think misplaced because it's like I'm disappointed in people. Well, that shouldn't surprise me. You know, I think that people can disappoint if you depend on them too much. You know what I'm saying? I think absolutely. There's absolutely. Other, but I don't know. I think it's crazy. They say 20 percent of the world's of the United States attend church. <clears throat> and I figured it out. There's about a church for every 100 or 200 people in most communities. Well, you know, I think. And this is going back a way, so I don't remember my statistics, but it's something to the effect of if you were to put, if you could fill every single seat in every church in America, you still wouldn't get, um, I think it's less than, it doesn't match your number, but I remember thinking it'd be like 10% of the population could even sit inside of a church. And there was a time, and so I don't know how accurate that is, but, and there was a time where it was quoting like statistics of how many church builds were happening every year. And it was funny because, you know, it was like a really exciting article, like, oh, every year we're planning 500 churches across the United States. But then if you look on the other side, it says, but also there's 450 churches a year that are closing down because, you know, these small community churches are kind of dying off. So it's like, we're really not making any progress. And and, uh, so, yeah. Man, you know, I don't know if you've seen this. You can actually, if you drive through Norman. And actually, Stacy pointed this out because she used to go, you know, Stacy's from Norman. Okay. And so right there on I-35, like as you're coming, like, let's say going south from Oklahoma City, there is this huge church there on the right, which would be on the west side. And she was just saying that she used to attend that church. And now that church is empty. I mean, in other words, they no closed shop. Yeah. No and I mean, I just couldn't quit thinking about it. Yeah. I'm like, because... The way she was talking about it, I mean, this sounded like a great church yeah. that I would like to visit. But then I'm like, man, they shut the door. And, and, I, and I think about how much money it took to build the church, how much money, you know, just all of us. Yeah. This was a huge, hey, Cassie. <laughs> said, oh, yeah. But anyway, it's, I mean, this is a huge building, you know. Yeah. And I think about like the church that I attend, they're actually in an old bowling alley. Yeah. And of course, they're talking about building a new church, too. Yeah. You know, it's you think about it from like a historical kind of going back to our earlier question. You think about it from a historical perspective. You know, what did the earliest church look like? You know, you were you're looking at very close knit communities. You almost had like a village type setting where everybody kind of had a little bitty house. You had your own family units, but essentially everybody lived together. You depended on your neighbors to trade with, to barter with, however, however else that worked. But you were such a close knit community. And then so the church aspect of that was that it was a daily thing because you were always all together. And as you move forward into the future, well, we get a little more separated. We have our own space. So we're not as involved with other families like it used to be, you know, even just a few hundred years ago. And I think about um, I think about like the Billy Graham revivals back in like the 30s and the 40s, whenever he did these tent meetings. And it was kind of it was really powerful because he would set up these massive stadiums to these massive tents and people would just flock. They were getting saved. And it was, it was just really incredible, this really powerful scene. And what happened is that a hundred years ago, we saw something work and we have not dared try to change how we do that. We we're, we're still trying to imitate what happened to work a hundred years ago. And we haven't tried to come up to something that fits our modern culture today because we're still hanging, we're still hanging on to that. And, we're yeah. not willing to acknowledge this is not effective anymore. There's documentaries about that. And, you know, part of it, it's like I see that, you know, something like that can be effective maybe to bring someone to Christ. But where I feel like the, where we're lacking is for a Christian to how do you live the Christian life? You know, how do you live day to day? How do you yeah. deal with, you know, life? And so it's like, you know, you're talking about Billy Graham, which obviously he did a lot of good and whatever else. But, you know, that is speaking to people who are not Christians to help them come to Christ. Mm -hmm. And then, but what about the people who are Christians? Well, exactly. You know, that's the exact point. We're using, we are using the churches 
for like we're using the framework that was for evangelism and we're trying to use that same one for discipleship. We're not separating the two. You know, there's evangelism, which is bringing people to Christ. Yeah. You know, a lot of people put evangelism when I say people, a lot of churches or people or groups, they put evangelism like on a pedestal Mm -hmm. that that's the most important thing. Do you think that that's like the most important thing or what's your thoughts on that? I think we've put it in a place that if you're not participating, like, if you're not participating in evangelism, you're going to hell. If you're not, if you're not participating in evangelism, you're not a real Christian. And I, and that's not being blatantly said, but I feel like that's kind of the guilt that people put on because it's like, if you really love Jesus, you're going to tell people about Jesus. So you should be participating. You should tell everybody about Jesus. And it's like, you know, that's while there's an element of truth to that, I think our approach is really, really horrible. It's very, um, it's a very systematic approach, and I don't think it's effective. One of my favorite speakers and authors, he actually, in his book, he talks about, um, and it's extreme, but he talks about when he was in college, that he felt such a huge drive to share Christ that it, like, honestly stressed him out more than school. Mm-hmm. It, it like, was a big guilt. It was a mm-hmm. burden on him. And he tells a story about how he's laying in his bed one night, you know, in college in his dorm room or whatever. <clears throat> and then we're talking about, like, two or three in the morning or that all of a sudden he just, like, realized that he did not share Christ with anyone today. So he gets <laughs> up, goes down to, like, yep. the corner store, and pretty much this is a turning point in his life and he loses it, you know, mentally because, you know, he felt like whatever he was doing was not good enough with such drive that, you know, he's awake at two or three in the morning to go share Christ. And that's the burden that he has. And he realized something was wrong, you know, crazy. Does that, uh, what's your, what, what do you think? I mean, a lot of people think like home groups that that's, Kind of that's I think their answer to this problem is doing a lot of home groups. Yeah. What do you, what's your thoughts on the answer to the problem? Honestly, don't know. I really I really don't have a good answer. Uh, Our church in America doesn't. I think it is kind of an American problem. I really do. Is that the churches in America really the problem? Don't. So, and you, you hear other people talk. The problem is we don't have any real problems. At least ones that we don't see. We get really, and when I say we, I'm talking about the church, we get really bent out of shape when we start talking about gay marriage. But you go down, do you look at I-35 of the route between Oklahoma City and Dallas, and apparently it's one of the biggest sex trafficking routes in America. And we sleep at night knowing that little girls are getting fill in the blank. I have my kids here. So, you know, it's like uh, that – I think that bothers me a lot when you start talking about the church too, is that we, we don't actually want to address any real problems and we want to get bent out of shape about politics. We want to get bent out of shape when people aren't conservative enough. We don't want to have an open mind to what's going on. And meanwhile, there are foster kids that need homes. There are, like I said, there's sex trafficking that we basically know nothing about that bothers me that we have absolutely no knowledge of how to address that issue at all. Yeah. Um, I think it does. I think we do, even though, you know, you, s- you see this supposed to be a separate, a separation from church and state, but yet, you know, we, con- I, it's funny. I was listening. You remind me of something. I was, I was sitting somewhere and uh, C-SPAN was on and it was in the background and I'm sitting in there. I was in a restaurant and C-SPAN was on and it was the committee that was listen listen about the Uvalde shooting, the you know the shooting at the school, mm-hmm. and so you have parents, but you also have pastors, and you have you know groups from the community that are talking. And this one, it blew me away. One of the guys that was speaking for the school for the kids, he basically said, if we brought back prayer into our schools and the paddle, then this wouldn't have happened. And it blew me away. And I mean, this really was said. And I was like, what? Yeah. You're telling me that that shooting wouldn't have happened if we had brought it back to paddle yeah. in prayer in school. That's ridiculous. 
you know? And I think that that's where we, and, and then also my thought was, man, we're sitting here with a, with a huge opportunity to talk in front of Congress, to be able to talk about what the real issues are. And yet this is our solution. It's like, ha. Huh. And you know what it is though, to me, it's like we're pushing this agenda, which is this constant agenda of like prayers in school, prayers in school will fix it. Well, the problem is not everybody believes the same kind of prayers. Not everybody well, believes that, you know. And and then you can dig into that problem even deeper. You'll hear people say like, like you don't want prayer in school. You want Christian prayer in school. Right, and you, right. you hear that from a, a, let's say, a non-believing person. And the problem is, is that they're correct. If you want, and this is where the church gets bent out of shape about, and they really show an ugly side. Because if you're going to actually understand what America is founded on and what America stands for. If you're going to allow prayer in school, it's all prayer. You need to allow your Hindu believing people to pray. You need to allow your Muslim believing people to pray, your Christian believing people. You know, it needs to be open to everybody. And for a church to be like, oh, no, only to Jesus. It's like you don't understand how stupid that makes you look because you can believe that Jesus is the right way. But to try to ignore what our actual rights and freedoms are in this country. It doesn't make you look like a devout Christian. It makes you look like an idiot because you have no concept of what this world looks like outside of the little walls of your little church and people. And the problem is, is that people are getting a lot smarter and the church has not kept pace with being intelligent enough about the world going on around them in order to communicate to those people. And all we're doing is shutting people off. Yeah, uh, there's two two ideas that's really come to my mind lately, and the first is that preaching or preaching doesn't work is what has come to my mind. And and what I mean by that is that I've realized that hearing somebody's story actually works. Mm-hmm. So, like for example, and I believe this concept at work for years. And the concept is if I want to get to know you and I want to build a friendship, then I have to understand and hear your story. Mm -hmm. So I listen to you and I know, hey, he's got two kids and he's got a wife and this is stuff is important to he, you know, has a gym. These things are important to you. Uh, Dave Ramsey, you know, I know these things about you and I understand. So I start to understand your story. And by understanding your story, even though your story don't look like my story, the bottom line is, is that I start to develop a relationship, a friendship with you based on your story. If you never told me your story, if I don't know anything about you, then you and I are going to be just kind of superficial, but also acquaintances. You know, you hear that word. And so I think that too many times there is a place. I do believe there's a place for teaching. Mm-hmm. There's a place for preaching. But I think that we made that such a huge thing that whether you turn on the radio or even TikTok or, you know, social media in general, and it's a lot of preaching at people instead of, hey, here's my story. Because if I tell you this is the way how I came to God, mm-hmm. and this is how God changed my life, then you can't refute that. Right. You can say, man, I don't agree with it because that's not how I came to God. Yeah. But the bottom line is you would be like, oh, well, that's the way he came to God. And that makes that builds this friendship and bond together when you start to understand people's story because it's your story and you know it's kind of like somebody says that hey a miracle happened in my life god healed me well if you you may not believe that god is actively healing today or you may believe it or not believe it but if i tell you my story then it's hard to refute it because yep. it's my story and i think we spend too much time preaching at people instead of telling them our we used to call it testimony. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you've been at probably church services where, you know, you had testimony night or something. And, you know, I think that the reason we have a bad taste in our mouth maybe about testimony is because you have one person stand up and they end up like going on and on mm-hmm. and on and on and you aren't given boundaries or time oh. limits or and so you're like, oh, we're not going to yep. do testimony yep. night because it's almost as bad as someone who is going to sing a special. It's like, oh, no, uh, yeah, they can't <laughs> sing. They can't sing. You know, nobody told them they uh, can't sing. Oh it's a wonderful gift to God when you're by yourself. Uh, <laughs> God loves it. I know. It's really come to my mind that like, man, yeah. we need to hear each other's story 
And that is completely different. And then the other thing that I see is that like we seem to get this is what I've done lately is that I've made God too complicated. You know, you've heard the verse that talks about like the road basically to God is very narrow Mm -hmm. and only certain people can get in there. Mm -hmm. Man, I've also I've actually come to the conclusion that it's the opposite, that God makes the road very wide and people can get there. But it's so wide and so simple that people miss it. And I wonder if like that inclusion gospel where it's like only this inclusive people can get in is not just killing the church. Because I if you think about really the whole the Bible in context and the whole whole of the Bible, what I see is that, man, he actually. I mean, I, one of my favorite stories is like the thief on the cross. I mean, like, man, there was no, you know, there was no prayer of salvation. There was no, exactly. you know what yeah. I mean? And it yep. was like, I think when I think about that story, it was, man, it was he simple. made the road wide. And it's like, you talk about people, you know, you talk about people who are sorry only because they get caught. I mean, that's the thief on the cross. There's no, there's no reconciliation of, oh, I'm going to be a good person. It's like, I'm fixing to die because of what I've done. Like, please remember me. And like, it's almost was, a foxhole prayer. Yeah, it's it's. They it's, talked it's, about that. It's you know, it's one of those things. It's it was good enough, you know. Yeah. And I think that we make it inclusive because we want. It's almost like we we want to be the elite, and if you follow our path and our way, then you're going to be just like me. Well, man, the problem with that is that we're not alike. You know, we have we come from different places. And those places are, um, you know, they're they're just different. You know, I don't know. It's crazy. You know, what if, you know, what if church on Sundays or whatever day you pick it up, it stopped looking like let's all put on our nice clothes, let's all show up, and let's all listen to some really mediocre music, and then let's listen to this guy talk to us for thirty minutes. And I'll go home. What if it looked like every Sunday we got together and there was a problem we were trying to solve? You know, whatever that might look like, whether it's addressing the homeless problem, whether it's addressing the orphan problem, you know, single mother problems. You know, I don't know, because it's what if it became less about talking and more about doing They actually brought that up in that C-SPAN that I was telling you about somebody. I think that the way they uh, approached it, the way they spoke about it was a little off base. But I do think that it does point to a bigger problem, which you mentioned, which it was talking about that a lot of these school shooters are actually have no male influence in their life, no father figure in their life. And so that's a real issue, you know, that we can try to address because, you know, I think that's why when you have like, you know, mentorship programs and things like that, that you see big sisters, big brothers. That's what they're trying to address is trying to address, you know, a fatherless society. And you see that all around us where there's, you know, men are not involved in their children's lives. And so it creates havoc on their life. What, um, another thing I bet, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. It's like, Do you think, well, well, let me ask you this. What, you know, I've been hearing this term a lot lately and I've heard it for years, but I've thought about it in a new light. You know, you have like atheist people. Well, they just don't believe there's a God. Well, but then I've heard this term agnostic a lot more lately. And I think that there's some truth in like agnostic, because when I think about agnostic, it's like what it means is without knowledge. Excuse me. So I think that what I see a lot is in our society is you have these people who are more agnostic than they are atheist. They're just trying to get the knowledge or they don't have the knowledge. They don't understand God. And so you have all, you think about like childhood. And I think about like how I grew up when it comes to church. I grew up in a very strict Baptist. And so it was hell and fire and brimstone. You know, you're going to hell. And and later as an adult, I realized there was so many contradictions, what they were teaching me as a child. 
And then so you have whether you come from that or you come from more, you know, more of a, you know, Holy Ghost kind of, you know, that kind of background. It doesn't matter. But you have that background you come from, which I call it like a lot of tradition. You're seeped in that tradition and it either makes you hate church. And that's what I see for the most part. It makes people hate church. And then you have everybody. Like I always say, if you turn on the radio, turn on TV, that's some of the worst Christian teaching that you can get turning on the radio or TV. It's almost and comical. You add in all this, then you add in your, you know, your spouse and their beliefs and you just add in all this stuff. And it's like, man, it's a disaster. You don't know what to believe. And I think that's where people are. They're agnostic. Yeah. Because they have no clue what to believe. You know, you know, there's a there's been enough teaching to come out lately about like the universe and um, that in particular. It's so precisely fine tuned that if that like just any one thing like gravity, if it's off by a percent, we either implode or we dissipate. You know, mm-hmm. it's so precise that the idea is like it's not absurd to think that there's some kind of creator involved. But at the same time, they've looked at the mess that Christianity has made, particularly in America. And they're like, I don't know that I want to be associated with that because that looks stupid. (laughs) Well, if you look at the history of Christianity, you cannot deny it's been a mess. You cannot deny. I mean, if you look at the Middle East and we talk about that all the time on the news, that is creative. That's a religious Christianity problem right over there, you know, And, and yet. It's funny because some of the people we dislike in America are actually Christians <laughs> that say they're claim they're Christians, and yet they're doing crazy stuff, and we don't agree with them. You know, uh, you know it's so bizarre. I think there was a, a documentary that came out on like Hulu or something. It was some uh, husband and wife of some mega church, and it comes out that the husband was hiring prostitutes, and the wife was filming it. All the while, they're supposedly leading one of the biggest Christian movements in America. And it's yeah. that's all it takes. You know, it doesn't. How how could you be a person underneath that ministry and not question everything you've ever been taught under that when that comes out? Yeah. You know? yeah. I think that part of the problem is, is that we are dependent on people. You know, it's like, oh, this guy's a great speaker. He yeah. is. You know, it's like I can hire someone to speak in an event that I'm having and I can pay them twenty thousand dollars. You know, Bill, I've heard like people like Bill Clinton and oh, you know, yeah. other people, they yeah, just like get million dollars or whatever yeah. to speak. You something know what absurd. I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. if you're going to pay somebody a million dollars to come speak, of course, they're going to be a dynamic speaker. Yeah. They probably, you know, took all kinds of classes and, you know, they're a dynamic speaker. But the if we put so much faith in a speaker, a preacher, a teacher, it's like I think that's where we automatically fail. It's like we're putting our, you know, we're putting basically our belief in a person. And of course, that's going to fail. You know, that's going to fail. And I don't know the easy answer, but, you know, part of it, I feel like that maybe the early church, like maybe each person like if you and I were part of the early church, our families were part of the early church and maybe you get up to that, you know, and talk about what God's done in your life, what's going on, what you, you know, kind of what we're doing now. And then I talk about it and it's like, we all talk about like what's going on in our lives and what God did in our lives. And in part of that testimony, you know, I don't know, instead of depending on, Hey, he's our leader, he's our pastor, he's our, you know, he's the leader. Really, I don't know. Crazy. Yeah. Oh boy, my two-year-old's Uh-oh. having, having a melt. In the background. My two-year-old's having a meltdown in here. <laughs> it's about nap time. Uh, yeah, I. You know, it, you stop and think about what we have for accounts of the early church and what they were doing. They were always pursu- They were always working on something it seemed like and it was always there was like a widow issue or an orphan issue or a hunger issue or you know it it wasn't a lot of just sit around and consume teachings 
Yeah. You know, that seemed to actually be kind of rare. Yeah. I could say, well, part of it is they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have, you know, what we have today. And even though the book, that book is super important, but also it's not, you know, they didn't have the book back then, you know, like they, you're right. I mean, if you think about like what was it, Stephen who was executed or whatever that he, or they were talking, you know, he was in charge of, I think, the food program or something, you know, and he was just talking about how to feed people and how to help the widows. And you're right. Yeah. No. Not happy. The nap time or just. She's a fireball, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I red has. She got red, kind of red head. Uh, we're thinking she might. Every now and then we'll get a hint of it, but I think it's going to end up being like her sisters. It's just going to be blonde. Yeah. You know, you're mentioning it yesterday. It's like stories in the Bible, and it's like they're hard to fathom a little bit with like you mentioned killing of children, killing of, you know, well, I've always said that it's like I go back to Iraq and Afghanistan. In the Bible, Whenever he wanted Israel, the Israelites to like take over a nation, he'd say, destroy everybody, everybody. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't destroy everybody. And so then their beliefs and their way of life would creep in and that would cause problems. So you have two sides of it. One, it's hard to fathom that God would want to destroy everybody, man, women, women and children. But then you have the other side and you can see like when we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, it's like we went in there, you know, in war thinking we're going to be their friends and we're going to become their friends. And so that war never ends. It just constantly continues on for years. I think we've been in Afghanistan or what or Iraq for like 10 years. It's like we continue to, you know. And so you were mentioning that yesterday, and I was thinking a lot about it last night. I was like, man, you know, that is hard to understand a God that says destroy everybody, kids, Mm -hmm. you know. And I think that, you know, a lot of people have a hard time swallowing that. You know, what if we, I just think about it, like, what if we were to think about it from the perspective of the Crusades? You know, what was it, like the 1600s or something like that? Yeah. And we, we think about that story and we read it. And we go, wow, what a what a misuse of the name of Jesus mm-hmm. for their own personal gain for whether it was to gain land or to destroy the people because they didn't like them and how it turned around and bit them in the butt. Because it's like they say that the Muslim faith was essentially dying like it was almost non-existent at that point and because of that uprising it kind of gave them a reason to band together and push forward and all of a sudden it kind of sparked a new flame in them and then like the muslim uh religion grew i don't know how true that is that's just kind of how i've heard that but then like let's say if you were to take a story out of the bible that is like pretty tough to listen to and understand and then we think about it in that light and we just read it as a story. We'd go, wow, what a misuse of the name of God because somebody didn't like this group of people. And because they decided to go stir the nest, they got bit, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, I, and it's just a theory. You know, I'm not claiming that it's true or whatever, but it's like, what if there are a line of priests who were allowed to write down holy documents from God because they had access to the holy place and they decided to write something that was of their own agenda and it looked like we're going to go attack these people and then well because y'all and then all of a sudden they get attacked and they get decimated it's like well it's because you didn't kill everybody like God said so it's like well what if because you weren't didn't have any business being over there in the first place and because you went and stirred the nest you had a natural consequence of of course they're going to come back and retaliate but, you know, it's like, well, we have to make an account of this in the holy teachings. And it's like if people come up like you said that God promised this. Like, well, clearly you didn't kill everybody. So God sent them to punish you kind of thing. It's like, you know, this could really be easily explained by people who had no business speaking on behalf of God being put in a position. Just like you said, we hold a teacher to a higher standard than we should. Yeah. And God said this, like maybe God didn't say that because one of the only really reliable accounts that we have from God is said, do not murder, you know? So it's like, 
you know, there's, it would be really easy to, it's not hard to draw that conclusion of maybe we were supposed to stop writing crap down after <laughs> Moses came or not Moses. Yeah. Moses after Moses came along, mm-hmm. right. Writes our 10 commandments and, you know, and that's, that's kind of my, my two cents on that. Well, as we talked about yesterday, one of my problems with, I think, and this all goes back, I guess, to maybe depending on, you know, human teachers is that, um, man, you can almost make the Bible say anything you want. Yeah. And that's where I start to have a real problem because I can, I can tell, you know, tell you many examples of where we've used the Bible to promote our own agenda. Oh, yeah. And I think tithing is a great example. And that's a part of a subject that will get people like very upset. I remember when I was young and dumb, which I'm still a little dumb, but not young. But I remember having a conversation with this lady and she was a pastor's wife and I worked with her. And I kind of said something to the effect of, you know, that we're not under tithing anymore (laughs) because it was under the law. And I was, the, my approach was horrible and <laughs> she got super, super upset <laughs> and started yeah. quoting, you know, all oh, these verses yeah. in Malachi, you know, and I just, oh, at the time, you know, of course I was not tactful at all, not one bit. Um, and I'm thinking these verses are taken out of context, you know, and I think that I see that a lot where we pull verses out of, you know, out of the Old Testament because they're popular or because they sound good. Mm -hmm. But when you really look at the context of it, it's not saying what we're saying, you know, it's not talking about exactly what we're talking about. And part of it, I I don't know if you ever do this or have done this in the past, but I like to look like do word searches, you know, for like Bible gateway that website is a great place. One of the great places to do it. You can take a single word and you can, you know, search it. But if you search tithing in the new Testament, Mm -hmm. it's in there basically one time. Mm -hmm. And the one time it's in there, it's talking about Melchizedek. In other words, it's talking about a story Mm -hmm. from the old Testament. It's not, you know, and so when I say that people just, Oh my God, how are you, you know, how are you going to support the church? And- exactly. You By suggesting that, you're suggesting changing the entire structure of the American church. And heaven forbid we talk about changing that. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it's got back to our earlier conversation, which, and again, this, this statistic may not be exactly right, but it's sure close. If 20% of Americans actually attend church, then they say only 20% actually, that of those 20%, actually pay for the church, actually yeah. tithe or give money. Yeah. And so and only 20% of 20% is actually supporting the church. And then it, it goes further than that. It's like of the 20% of the 20% that are attending, only 20% are tithing. And only 90% of that 20% is tithing like 3%. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, there's a very small percentage that actually give the full 10% tithe. And it's like, you look at the majority of tithers, they the average is only about 3%. So yeah. nobody's actually tithing correctly. Um, right. Even though so, it is a big agenda. Yeah. Talk about. Oh, yeah. It's a huge agenda. You know, and I'm, yeah, I, I kind of feel like the idea of a full-time pastor is obsolete. I don't feel I don't feel like that is something that we should continue doing just because you become as a full-time pastor where your only job is to look after this church and preach, you become one of the most irrelevant people on the planet because you have you have no skills whatsoever for helping anybody out. If somebody's freaking pipes bust under their house and they're you can't help anybody because you don't have any skills. You don't have any business skills because you depend completely on a charity donation system. So you don't actually know how to generate money for the church. And so I feel like this idea of a full time pastor is is pretty obsolete. And it goes. It's, it's funny you bring that up because I follow a guy on on social media who the way he starts out his podcast and a lot of stuff he's like we don't pastors are not basically right and he, his point is is that same thing what we're talking about it's like if you're depending on a person. 
to lead you versus Christ, then it starts becoming this person centered instead of Christ centered. And so, and I think he, he, he purposely says it the way he does, maybe to be a little controversial, but the bottom line is I believe he's right. It's that that position was man-made and you don't see that when you see the word pastor in in the, in the new Testament, it's not explaining it like we do it. It's right. basically saying there's this guy, but it doesn't, he has no authority. Yeah. When you look at the word in the in the Bible, it's like he has no authority. No. Well, our pastors today, they have all kinds of authority, you know, and you can say, why did he have no authority back then? It's because they didn't want to put all their hope in one person. And I think the same thing with like Paul. Paul has said, you know, he's talking about the other disciples or the other you know, leaders, he's like, man, these, he's like, what does it matter? It's Christ. It's not me. It's not, you know, ta- uh, it's not their teaching that matters. It's, it's Christ that matters. You know, yeah. I think we get away from that person centered. Uh, I don't know. Good stuff. You know, I've got a pretty unpopular, probably what I would be considered a pretty unpopular opinion. So I don't know if this part will need to be cut out. So if you can do some editing when you go to your car desk. I would dare to say, at least in my experience, most of your people who are in some sort of past position, I hesitate whether I should even say it, are, <laughs> Go ahead and say that too. they're losers. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're losers. You, in, in the respect of, you look at their life, you look at their life of probably from high school to even college. They probably couldn't stay on. They probably couldn't pick a career path. One, probably because they were lazy and they didn't actually want to go out and actually work really hard at something. But they kind of felt this draw to the church. And I'm going to be honest, if you were to really check somebody's motives, that was probably the easier path. Because you take somebody um, who's essentially like, because a really natural path is for someone to come in and start in youth ministry, be in youth ministry for a while. And then they graduate to senior pastor. And you look at somebody who probably was a bit of a loser in school and you put them in their about their mid twenties and you put them over some high school kids. Well, these high school kids kind of look up to this person while all of a sudden their status elevates because they went, they went from kind of being at the bottom of the food chain in their social pyramid and you put them at the top and they kind of get this prestige because it's inside of this church. And what ends up happening is you get a lot of people who are kind of losers in the society and they end up becoming leaders of this movement and they really have no business leading. If that makes sense. And it's you, you get somebody and then what happens is they get trapped into this ministry thing, right? Because you spend, let's say five, six, seven, eight years as a full-time youth pastor and you have one of two choices you can. And like I say, you need to get your income up and, you know, you can either graduate to becoming a senior pastor or you can go get a real job and you want to look at them. You want to see them shudder, suggest to them that they go get a real job and actually go work. And it's like, mm, I'm going to go be a senior pastor. I feel pretty called. And because that's that's the easier route. And you get a lot of people who spend 20, 30, 40 years in ministry who probably have no business standing behind a pulpit, but they actually can't go do anything else because they don't have any other skills. They would have to go start at the bottom at some entry level job and try to earn some kind of income. So this idea of a full time pastor is actually kind of dangerous because you lock this person in because there's not an easy way out when it comes to providing for their family. Mm-hmm. So what do they do? They just suck it up and stay a pastor for 20 years when they probably have no business standing behind a pulpit. Yeah. And I mean, this is a little bit off subject, but it's kind of on it too, is that, you know, we expect these pastors today, they have to be a teacher. They mm-hmm. have to be a leader. They, You mentioned it earlier. They have to be a financial manager, CEO of the mm-hmm. church, mm-hmm. you know, and then they have to be uh, like, they have to go and, you know, be a part of visiting the sick and being part of funerals and death and dying counseling. Mm-hmm. Think about it, doing marital counseling, doing counseling with children, doing counseling with, you know, with all kinds of situations. It's like, there is no way even, you know, and I would say a small percentage of people of like pastors actually went to seminary, but most of them don't. Um, And you think about like who in the world has that much skill and knowledge and ability 
to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to be your counselor on yeah. on Friday, but on Sunday, I'm going to be the speaker. And then on our business meeting, I'm the leader. You know, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, what do they say? What's the world's most powerful aphrodisiac? <laughs> You know, power, power, authority. Yeah. And, you know, you put and the problem is as a pastor. If you're doing that correctly, a pastor should be looking for people within his congregation that have these abilities, that have these skills like that person's really good with money. He should be our treasurer. That person's, you know, really good with this. And they should probably handle this side of things for me. And, and instead, pastors kind of get this control freak nature to them to where they feel like they need to have control of everything. And so they. Like you said, they don't really relinquish these thinking that they're capable and they end up doing a pretty subpar job of everything. Yeah. Well, I was telling you earlier, there was two things that have really hit me lately. One is that we need to be telling our story versus preaching so much. But the other is, is that I've noticed, I think anytime we preach against sin, we've messed up. And what I mean by that is like, I don't believe we're called to basically preach against or teach against sin. Mm -hmm. What I believe that we, I think that when we go down that route, that's when we really get in trouble because we have to pick the hot topics like abortion. We have to pick gays. We have to pick, you know, these items that are like almost political. Instead, I think that if we actually preach God's love, we talk about his love. We talk about what he did on the cross. We talk about his resurrection. We talk about our identity in Christ. I think where we get in trouble is when we preach against sin. And you see that a lot. Some some of it's very subtle and some of it's like in your face when you're talking about, like, for example, abortion. I, you know, that that subject came up, you know, recently politically where, you know, Roe versus Wade was overturned. And it all it really amazes me when you bring up a subject like that because it's a very hot button topic. And you really you wouldn't you wouldn't think so, but you have Christians on both sides of it. You have Christians who are like, what are we doing? Why are we banning abortion? And then you have Christians on the other side, of course. The louder voice of Christianity is, of course, saying no, but we're picking, it's easy, that's like an easy subject to pick. And if I'm a politician, I don't even have to be a Christian. If I want to attract the Christian people, then I just say, "Hey, I'm against abortion." If I want to attract pro right, pro pro right, or pro rights, or whatever it is, then I, you know, I just got to speak those words to those people. And I think that where we make a mistake, period, is is that we're preaching or teaching or we're opposing. And I know where they get that from, but I think it's mis it's a misconception. Yeah. It's it's a little bit late to the party as well, because if you're if you're not out, if you're not teaching and really holding to traditional, um, I guess, marriage values of, you know, leaving, because a lot of times I, I would assume that abortion happens from sex outside of wedlock. It's not typically married couples. Seeking right. abortion. Of course, there are, of, you know, of course, they're part. But I think the majority is the conversations you've got, you know, essentially kids who are out trying to live their best life. And a kid's really going to screw this up right now. And it's like the, the church gets all up in arms when you want to start when you want to start talking about this in. But then we don't want to talk about sex outside of marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just like it's like yeah, you guys are just too late. And like one of my one of the examples and it's a it's a really it's far more simple, but this is kind of a personal example. Um, it's, it's been a few years ago. It was shortly after I left, um, stepped down from youth ministry and we came back home. Somebody from that church had posted on a Facebook post and they were really upset because they had made it legal for, I think, um, movie theaters to start serving alcohol. And she was really bent out of shape about it. And she was throwing a fit. And of course it was from a Christian perspective of it's of how horrible it is. I can't believe we're allowing this to happen. And, and I was stopping and thought, it's like, that sounds so stupid because mm-hmm. you're talking about uh, an establishment that is not one, it's not a Christian establishment. It's a movie yeah. theater. You're talking about an establish, establishment that regularly shows people getting killed, people getting raped, people having sex, people drinking on screen. And you yeah. have not once thrown a fit about any of that. But all of a sudden, now that alcohol has been presented, you're a hall high and mighty. This is a God-fearing country, and we shouldn't have that. It's like, 
we've got to stop doing that because we are way too late to the party. We are expecting a secular, a secular establishment to hold on to a true a Christian value. And it just doesn't work. And I think, I think that kind of applies. I think, I think there is a conversation to be had about abortion and why, mm-hmm. and why it's wrong, of course, but it's not from a God fearing, you know, you shouldn't do that because we're a Christian nation kind of thing. It's like, that's not a good approach. Yeah. I see it. You know, uh, I, there's some signs here close about an hour from here and they're all over like this farmer's field and what these signs are, they're, they're verses from uh, the old Testament and what it's doing is it's it's basically condemning people who've had abortion. Uh, it drives me crazy because I think the last thing somebody who's had an abortion needs to hear is condemnation. That's absolutely true. You know, and that's another thing when we're talking about preaching against sin or not. Yeah. Or, but, you know, what I believe it's like, man, it never does good to preach about it after the fact. Exactly. Well, you know, here, if you really want, let's get philo- philosophical with it, if that's even the right word to use in this. But what do you think happens if we really believe that life begins at conception? The moment that baby's conceived, that is a life that was, you are knit in the womb by the hands of God, if we're going to start yeah. quoting scripture. What do you think happens to that, that fetus, that baby? What do you think happens when it gets aborted from a spiritual perspective? Yeah, it goes to heaven. It goes, goes to heaven. Like, right. like, so it's like, if we really wanted to get, really wanted to talk about this, it's like, sure, we can get upset about it, but it's like, hey, it's, you know, there's a reason to believe, like, there's actually kind of a win. If you're, you're like begging this child to be born into this sin filled world and essentially giving them a chance of going. And I understand that doesn't solve the problem, but it's like, have a little bit broader of a perspective on it of, you know, abortion is not the actual issue. There are, are bigger underlying issues and. Yeah. Anyways, check this out. I was at a funeral recently and it was like basically somebody that works with my wife and we were in this small, small town and we're in the like the Baptist church there in the small town. And uh, we we, I'd never been to this church. I didn't know. You know, I just knew the few people that worked with my wife and as church, as the service is about to begin, we're all just kind of sitting there and behind me. Well, first of all, this guy walks in who you can tell he's not from Oklahoma. He's not from the South. He's wearing like a fedora type hat. Okay. Classic um, and, you know, and so he's wearing this and he's wearing it in church and he keeps it on the entire service. Right. Sure. And so these ladies behind me, they began talking about this guy like he had just killed somebody. And I mean, on and on. Why has he got this hat on? Why does he have this hat on in church? Why does he, Why when we're praying, why does he leave his hat? I mean, it's going on and on. And come to find out they attended this church. And I thought, my gosh, that has to be the worst. Like for Christianity, this is like the worst kind of like, man, they don't know me. We can all, I can hear them. I can hear everything they're talking about. And I'm like, man, this is a the yeah. worst witness at all. And then I start thinking about the church that I attend. Yeah. I can wear a hat yeah. the church yeah. I attend. You know, what I'm I totally I got. Wear one. I was but, still. I don't know if I. I think Cassie and I were dating at the time. Oh, yeah, we were. And, you know, I've, I've worn a hat almost my whole life. Some, some, something's been on my head almost every single day of my life. And um, I had a hat on, walked in, and a guy. Saw it on it, turned around, he said, Hey, take your hat off in church. And I'm like, Whatever. And I, I took it off and it was fine. But I told him after several, I was like, I just want you to know that if I was, wasn't was an unbeliever and you told me to do that, I'd never come back here again. And he goes, Really? And it's like, it's like, there was a moment where, like, he actually, like, I think he caught that. And because it's to your point. And I, and I told him that. I was like, If I was an unbeliever, if I didn't believe and I came in here and somebody told me to take my hat, I would never come back to this place. Oh, and, and, and that was my message of, don't tell new people to take their freaking hats off. And just exactly to your point. It's like, what a petty, petty thing to get focused in on. Oh, it is. Well, I'll tell you another story like that. It has nothing to do with church. It wasn't a church, but I attended a meeting and we're talking about peers. In other words, we're all equal. There's not, this is not a work yeah. meeting. This is a peer meeting. Everybody's on the same level. And the guy running the meeting, there's this younger guy 
And he actually, and this is at the beginning of the meeting, he has his phone out and you can tell he's like kind of close, finishing out whatever conversation, like maybe he's even saying, hey, I'm fixing to go to this meeting. So he has his phone out and the lead, kind of the head of the meeting, again, he wasn't like the boss. It was just, he was leading this meeting. He calls that guy out and says, man, you need to put up your phone when you're in here. And had, and I thought about that over and over again. What if that had happened to me? I don't think I would have had the reaction. This kid had his reaction. He's like, oh, he just basically puts up his phone. But I'm thinking if that had been flipped around, I'm like, I, I, I've replayed it in my head. I'm like, what would I have said? I actually give the kid a lot of credit because all he did was just put it up and didn't say anything. Yeah. But part of it's like, I'm thinking I would have said, Hey man, I'm 50 years old. I can decide to put up my phone or not. You know what I mean? And I'm like, but we do that in church. Yeah. You know, like us laugh and joke about like, and I've had this happen where you visit a new church and you sit on, you know, in this particular pew and it ends up being somebody else's seat and they kind of look at you <laughs> crazy and it's like, what in the world are we doing? You know, we yeah, have to find so seats. Dumb. So, well, and I, I, I've mentioned yeah. this book to you before, but, um, you know, it's and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but there's this book called Freakonomics. And what I like about it's a very well-known, popular book. But one of the things it does talk about there in in the book, it talks about abortion and how the reason in the 90s we had like the gangster rap and all the crime we had is because we had banned abortion. And that was the result of it is this huge drug crime spree. And then when we, you know, legalized abortion, that pretty much went away. Uh, Uh, The huge height in crime. Now, again, I'm not advocating one way or another, but I know that a lot of that is it 100 percent based on facts and was other extenuating circumstances, of course. But still. One of the things I love about that book, that's just one subject of many, yeah. but it makes you really think. Yeah. It's like when we impose our beliefs on other people, there is consequences, there is results. Yeah. And it's not the results that we necessarily think that should be, you know, or that we want. And um, it makes you really think about it. You know, I don't know. Have you read that book? I have not. I need to write it down. It's very interesting. Freakonomics it sounds very. I think you'll know, like it because I, I'm always, you know, economics was probably my favorite subject in college. But it's like it's like human behavior when it comes to business and human behavior when it comes to spending and human behavior. And I think that like it would really uh, interest you is because why do we buy a new car and why do we, you know, all those things? That's what economics is. It's yeah. like okay. Uh, when spending goes down, in other words, when we have like our income goes down, obviously our spending goes down. And so, but it makes you realize, okay, but why did our spending go down? But yet we ended up buying a new car. What in the world yeah. happened that caused us to do that? You know, yeah, pretty interesting. interesting. That is interesting. Well, brother, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and yeah, having that's fine. great conversations. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Yeah, likewise. And, uh, likewise. So you're going to your mom's house. That's basically what's going to happen. Yeah, we'll get up. We'll do our thing in the morning with the kiddos and hang out here for a little while. Then we'll go over to mom's and have a big breakfast and do Christmas over there. Yeah, I, I think I said it at the beginning. I have a little uh, negative attitude attitude toward Christmas. I guess I'm going to have to get over that and put on so, a good face and do it. Why negative? Why? Why bother? I don't know. You know, I know this. I don't want it to turn into poor, pitiful me, but I think that like part of it is like, um, I think that not being around like a lot of my personal family, I think that's part of it. Yeah. Uh, this is the sounds poor, pitiful me, but also you know my mom died on yeah. Christmas, and I think that that also has something to do with it, and I yeah. really. I that's struggle pretty, with that a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty understandable. That's that'd be a yeah, part thing. of me wants to be like, get over it. You know, it's yeah. two years ago. But well, yeah, that's that's and, still tough, man. Yeah. So there's another part. That, I mean, you're close to your mom. I know that. And yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah. You know, I. You, it's weird because I think I'm having a harder time 
this year than last year. And last year was the one year anniversary, but I don't know why this time seems to be tougher. You know, it's like, it's almost like this cloud has kind of been over me the last, yeah. you know, few weeks. And I'm like, oh, I don't want it to be there. And, uh, but it's just there. So. so I thought of a question earlier, I think last night, and it made me write it down. You know, part of, I guess, trying to find, I'm going to call it finding my way through this life. Right now, I'm in a place where every single decision I make, I, I feel a huge implication of what, how does it affect my children? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, literally everything from the job I work to the hobbies I decide to do to time I decide to spend, say, away from my family to hang out with friends to opening this gym. I I literally everything like the like the biggest implication is how does it affect my kids? And and I got kind of got to thinking, you know, it's going to be interesting because, you know, in about 20 years, that's going to shift really, really hard because it's everything I do is going to have a basically going to have less implication on my kids because they're going to be at the point where they're adults and they're doing their own life. And I thought an interesting question, because you're kind of in that place now of, you know, what, what does that look like from a parent side? Like I got, I got, I got to look to see how I actually got worded the question. Um, You know, I guess, what does it mean to be, what does it mean to be a father in this stage of your life? You know, yeah. you're at a place where you're you're pursuing a new career. You're you've got hobbies and aspirations that you're doing, but you have adult children. You know, how how does that affect you as a father? Yeah, I think that's great. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind as you said that was, man, not every father thinks like you're thinking. Like I did, I did. Like I constantly worried about my kids and how what I was doing was affecting my kids. And now, but one thing I've realized, and it's taken me a lot of time, I just kind of assumed that every father thought like that. Right. And I would say majority do. I, I would say that, but I also know that not every father thinks that way. And uh, it's kind of sad, but there's, there's some truth to that. And I think number one, the fact that you think that way, that is, it just shows you the man that you are that you really care about your kids and what happens and how you're, what you're doing affects them. And not every father thinks that way. And so I want to tell you that, but also part of it, like to answer your question, like I think part of me, and I have to be real careful with this is that I can live in retrospect a lot, you know, because now it's, you know, it's like the movie's been played Mm -hmm. with my kids growing up and and it's easy to pick apart every mistake I made throughout this journey. You know, it's easy to pick that apart because, man, did I make mistakes? Yes. Did I make the wrong decision and didn't put my kids first and, you know, in these situations? Of course I did. In, in fact, not not that long ago, I really kind of did, did an inventory of my life. And I realized that I had not put my kids first in several areas. And in, in, and sometimes it was pursuit of money. Sometimes it was pursuit of not even things that great. Yeah. Um, but I'm in this place now where also um, I think that like, I like, I, I love it. But I love how it's put. It's like, they talk about that for the most of your life, you sit there and you think about the future, like the future, the future, right. the future you know, yeah. which is not always good because you're not right. living in the present, but right. you're saying, Oh, I have, you know, I've been alive for 30 years or I've been alive for this many years. And you, but part of it is like, man, I start to, I'm starting to realize I only have so much time left. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite football coaches just died. And the reason mm. I like him is because, um, because he was a coach of Texas Tech. And I mean, phenomenal offensive mind. I mean, this guy was great. Um, but he died, and he died at 61 years old. That's you know, and we're talking about a guy that, you know, you would and, and so I start thinking like that. It's like, what can I accomplish between now and the end of my life that really makes an impact? I like the word, I've been using it so much lately that probably yeah. Stacey's sick of hearing it. But I like the idea of like a legacy. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of like, what do I want to leave my kids? And and 
it's easy. The first thing you think is money or property or assets, but really I'm thinking, what do I want to leave them? And, and, and it's like, I think I can take this time that I have left. And I love to also say, man, I've got, you know, 30 more years to go. <laughs> but I think that me, that's how my mind thinks. It's like, what can I leave of lasting value? I, you know, another word I use a lot is dynasty is I want to build a dynasty. And that dynasty is not with the foundation of money and wealth. Yeah. It is a foundation of like, man, you know, God, it's a foundation of like, you know, also, I hope my kids see that I have failed and yet I didn't quit. Yeah. I just kept trying, you know, with with uh, uh, me thinking about, you know, you know, this with like m- multiple people in my family committing suicide. It's like, man, they quit. Yep. And I can't imagine, to be honest with you, Sean, I cannot imagine quitting on my kids. Yep. You know, I've been in that dark place where I was real depressed or just struggling and feel like I could do nothing right and whatever. But the one thing I haven't done is quit. You know what I mean? And still, it's like, why am I doing podcasts? And why am I talking to my friend, Sean? And it's because, man, I want to leave something. for. I hope they listen to this recording one day when I'm dead and gone. And they're like, man, these guys had great conversation. They had a great friendship. And I hope they learn from that. And I think those things are really a great foundation to to leave instead of wealth. You know, yes, I don't want my kids to struggle financially, but on the same point, it has to be through knowledge, yeah. not me leaving them millions of dollars. You know, I, uh, I've i thought about that for a long time I, because I like hearing stories from my mom's side of the family, particularly about like my papa. My papa would tell stories about when he was a kid. And then my mom would tell stories about when she was a kid. And then it's like, I can see this evolution of our family to where literally my papa, he talked about going out when it was wintertime, he would go shoot rabbits. He'd get home and he would throw them on the roof where the snow was because it would keep them fresh. And then he'd cook them and clean them and all that stuff. And then my mom would tell stories about her mom being a single mom and how, you know, they would celebrate at the end of the month. If there was $20 left over from paying all the bills, they would celebrate by going and getting a pizza and renting yeah. a movie and how much she treasured those memories. And I, and then I can look and see how hard my parents worked, <clears throat> and we had more than they had because they stepped it up and essentially added their block to this pile. And now we're better for it. And now like, I see it as my responsibility as a kid. It's my turn to add something else to that. So like, what is it that my kids are going to get that are better than what I got? And I think there's part of that's why the whole Dave Dave Ramsey thing stuck to me really hard because it didn't resonate so much with me as much as it did with what I'm going to be able to give my kids. Mm -hmm. The knowledge I'm going to like something that I learned in my 20s, they get to grow up learning. So they get to expand on that even more, just like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not so much about having the wealth as it is knowing how to go get it. You know, one of the. It's funny because one of the one of the deciding factors of wanting yeah. to start a gym is it's kind of intimidating trying to start a business just because I've got other than you, I have no one to to glean off of. Like I don't have anybody in my family that's ever ran a business, ever started a business. I have no one to go like, hey, what would you do in this situation? And part of me has thought, like, man, what if what if my kids have an aspiration to start a business when they become an adult, I would like, I would really like to be able to be in a position where they go, dad, how did you do it? You know, it's going to suck that if they come to me and I'm like, I don't know, kids, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how, cause I never, I never pursued it. Um, so that I felt, I felt it as a responsibility to be able to have some of this knowledge that I can pass down to them. Well, and I think that's great. Cause that goes back to what I was saying is like, I hope my kids see that like I, Man, I I wasn't scared to try stuff, you know? And, you know, we talked about, like, religion and all that stuff earlier, but, you know, I love the idea of tradition. You know, you can have bad tradition. Like, if you you believe some things, like, from your past or when your childhood that about God that that is not true, well, then that could be bad tradition, you know? But on the same point, like you go into your mom's house and y'all haven't sitting down and having that dinner. It's like 
I remember like hunting with my my boys and just us enjoying like freezing cold and you know backpacking and these things. And you know, part of I'll never forget this. It's like I went to go help a friend out. They're they're farmers and they own quite a bit of land and they have quite a bit of cattle and they do farming, all that stuff. Well, they asked me to go help move cattle and I went to go help. And I'll never forget, like, it just really blew me away because I had never really seen this in in person. I'd heard about it. But, you know, when we're working these cattle, all the women were out there doing their part, working like a well-oiled machine because they had done it before. And I love seeing the kids out there helping. And I love seeing the wives out there helping. And everybody knew their spot. I'm not saying there was no disagreements or arguments. Sure. But still, everybody had like their, what they were good at is what they did because yeah. they've done it so many times. So if they were good at like doing the inventory of the cattle and marking down, then that's what they did. Or if they were good at bringing in the cow, that's what they did. And then I'll never forget, right about lunchtime, everybody stopped. And we went to like the grandmother's house and we all sat down and we had a meal together and me included. So part of it, like it was very impactful because I wasn't family and they made me a part of family and they, this was their tradition. And that impacted me. Like I can't, can't explain fully because I'm like, this is what it should be about. Yeah. You know, and yes, I'm not talking about just cattle or farming, right. but that we, you know, it's done together as a family and we know each other's strengths. We respect each other's strengths. We, we really like part of it's like, man, I'm not good at this. So it's good to see somebody that is good at it. And we really respect yeah. those things. And, you know, I saw a part of that when I went to go ahead, we were talking about it and I couldn't remember if it was Thanksgiving or Christmas. But, it, you know, you said it was Thanksgiving, but I, I'll never forget, you know, coming to your mom's house on Thanksgiving with my mom yeah. and how you guys invite. She was in the nursing home then there. And so, you know, but that family, that structure, that was there. You know what I mean? And I love it. And I think that what I want to leave is my kids. I want them to think about stuff like that. You know, I want them to really You know, you can have all kinds of disagreements in family and, you know, maybe you don't get this like I don't get to see my dad. I've never spent a Christmas as an adult or a Thanksgiving with my dad, as an example. But I think that we can show our kids the way it's supposed to be. You know what I mean? And though it's not perfect, it's like, man, it's a you know, part of that is just the, the ability to glean off each other or whatever, you know, learn from each other and whatever. Yeah. All right, brother. I hope you have a great Christmas. Yeah, you and, too, man. Uh, tell your wife I said hi. And uh, if you need something, holler at me. Yep, Thanks likewise. For time. All right, brother. Talk Later, to you soon. Man. Bye. Thank you again for listening to I'm Fine Safe. If any part of this show resonated with you, share it with your community. Help others see that being vulnerable isn't being weak. It takes courage. Don't forget to subscribe and follow on your podcast app of choice so that you can get this show downloaded each Monday. And thank you again for listening.